Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise for a point of personal privilege. Down the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen of the House, a uh, couple things, I guess, maybe this is an announcement, of it, but it is a point of personal privilege. We've got on the docket today a veto of uh, uh, having to do with judgeships. There is a uh, governor's bill that's just been sent down. Uh, we think that it provides a fix without getting into this thing, whether we have to give away legislative prerogatives or not, and I hope that you'll think about that. Um, I appreciate the comments from the gentleman from Colonial Heights, and it does point out there's clearly philosophical differences of opinion that go back a long, long time. Uh, we really don't have time to talk about them today. I mean, Medicaid, Medicare, I don't know if we want to talk about so a whole host of other things that have really done some terrific things for our country, and I think it would be very difficult for us to go back on now, and I hope that we really don't seriously think about that. Uh, the Medicaid uh, issue has been thoroughly debated back and forth. Uh, I won't say anything more about that. But one thing I do want to say today, and that is, uh, Mr. Speaker, we're at the end or hopefully at the end of a long and pretty arduous budget process. And the good news is we have a signed budget. And no matter what happens today, that budget will become law on July 1. So nobody's talking about shutting down the government. We're not gonna go back and forth on that point. There is a signed budget. Now we have to deal with eight pieces, eight easy pieces that stand by themselves. And my hope today, Mr. Speaker, is that we can respect our process, that we can respect our democratic constitutional process, and we res will respect what our constituents expect of us to let them know where they stand. We need to vote on all eight vetoes. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Speaker, the veto process is as old as the Republic itself, and item vetoes actually go back to the 1870 Constitution of, of Virginia. Now, in Article 5, Section 6D of the Constitution, it sets forth the language that the governor shall have the power to veto any particular item or items. That's pretty clear, any, not some, any that he chooses to do. The veto is historical and it's important in history and it goes back to the Federalist Papers. You remember them, we hear about them occasionally on the floor, not so much this term. And the veto is not based on the ver wisdom and the virtue, said Federal Federalist 73, of the executive. It's on the, based on the principle that the legislature is not infallible. And that there's always a risk that the legislature may trample on the rights of others. Madison was always concerned about the faction taking over. The veto is in part a response to that concern. The veto is not related or designed to frustrate popular will, but instead to limit legislative excesses. Oh, I know we never engage in les legislative excesses. And it has nothing to do with our motives. Now some people will say, yeah, okay, it's improper motives of the legislature. It has nothing to do with our motives, but we can make a mistake. And the veto is there and was created out of a good faith belief that legislators may make mistakes. That's why we come back here to do the veto process. You know, there are a lot of, a lot of, been a lot of vetoes over the years. I think had more than most, maybe Governor Gilmore had more. Warner didn't have very many, many vetoes at all, and now we're going to see what uh, His Excellency, Excellency Governor McAuliffe does. But you've got to watch, and these are two that we really need to vote on. Number one is the governor's vetoing of the Merck language. The rationale of the governor is clear. He says that when 
Merck was enacted, it was unconstitutional. We remember that argument. And you remember that there were 17 of you on this side who voted against the conference report because you agreed at that time with Attorney General Cuccinelli and his opinion that Merck was unconstitutional. So ladies and gentlemen, if you believe that it was unconstitutional then, you ought to cast the vote to sustain the governor's veto and say that it's unconstitutional now. But at the very least, vote. Show your constituents in an open and transparent way where you stand on that particular issue. Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen of the, of the House, then you've got the so-called Stanley Amendment. It's born out of that long, long discussion of how many weeks ago. And I remember standing out in the hall with senators from both the Republic, Republican and the Democratic side debating whether the Stanley Amendment was subject to a gubernatorial veto. Very interesting. The Republicans on the Senate side took the position that it was. They said it was subject to veto consideration. Surely we may hear an argument that it is not properly before the body. In other words, there will be no vote. Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen of the House, that would be a tragedy. If you look at that amendment, and I hope you will, I hope you will carefully consider the clearly articulated statements of the Speaker. When he was quoted to say about this amendment, necessary. It was not essential to the budget. In other words, it is a separate item, ladies and gentlemen, and can be voted upon. But beyond that, you may hear an argument that it is unconstitutional to consider this amendment, that the amendment is so deeply embedded that it is not subject to the item veto. This is a constitutional call. And when that motion is made, if it is made, and I hope it won't be, I would point you out the statements of the speaker again when he has stated that he does not rule on constitutional issues. And ladies and gentlemen, he should not rule on this one. That should be a judicial determination. And the speaker has said on many occasions that it, he is neither a judge nor wants to. No way that you can find anything in our Constitution that makes the General Assembly the gives the General Assembly the ability to make a finding about constitutionality. That is not the easiest way to avoid this problem altogether is to vote on that veto. Vote it up, vote it down, but vote on it. That's what our citizens want to see. Beyond that, there's a question legally whether the Stanley Amendment is a general law. And if it is a general law, there are problems if you decide not, not to consider it for veto. Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen of the House, we value democracy. We do value transparency. We do value an open process. I've heard both sides of the aisle talk about, about that. We may agree or we may disagree. But if we don't vote, we'll not know. Please do not use a parliamentary maneuver to deny everybody the right to vote. Let's be, we may be philosophically divided on some of the issues that the member, that the uh, delegate from Colonial Heights referenced, but let's not be divided by this one. This is democracy at its best. Mr. Speaker, we deserve the right to vote, and it's our citizens demand and expect to hear what we think on those critical issues. Thank you.
gentleman from Prince William, Mr. Marshall. 